we uh, thank you all for uh, coming today. My, my name is Dave Reese, and uh, on behalf of Mike Swetnam, our, uh, our CEO, and General uh, Gray, the Chairman of our Board of Regents, we've got the uh, Commander, Commander's Return Series again, and we're honored that, that you're here. Uh, Expeditionary is a word that's thrown around these days. Uh, these guys have done it, though, and uh, it's good to have you back. Uh, General Gray will be poking his nose in. It's uh, it's interesting because we've got the we got Gordy Kaiser here, who was the uh, a few years ago was the second Mao sock to be certified. A long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, and uh, uh, it'll bring back some great great memories for him and be able to compare and contrast. And when General Gray comes in, he might give you a little bit about it too, because he knows a little bit about this topic too. Yeah, At this point in time, some slides will be coming up, but uh, Dave asked to start talking, and we'll kick things off on time. So, gentlemen, the floor is yours once again. Thanks for being here. Thank you, sir. Okay, well, I'm Captain Jim Cody, Colonel Matt Sinclair, and we're here to talk about. Uh, we've been up here all week. We've briefed in our higher headquarters, and we have a slide presentation. But the, the the other couple think tanks that we've done, and this is, I, I think, about the third or the fourth, um, we've generally used as our, our slide presentation as a point of departure. So we'll put a couple slides up, and when the topic steers itself to something that may be up there, we'll, we'll, put, we'll ask to advance to that slide. But we're hoping um, that you, you guys dictate what we talk about. We deployed from March, of, uh, March 11th of uh, this year. We came back on November 7th. And if you think back to what, what was going on in the world, when we left, we thought we'd be involved in the uh, Syria in terms of humanitarian assistance because the refugee crisis was spilling in over, over into all the, the neighboring countries. We figured we'd get involved somewhere in that capacity. Um, but when we left in March, that's what we thought. We did a lot of exercises. Our front beginning of our deployment, back up one second, we... Uh, Really, we were assigned as presence to the 5th Fleet for six months. So we went through the Suez Canal in early April, left the Suez Canal October, uh, early October, about six months apart. Um, went through the Mediterranean, so we were uh, assigned to the 6th Fleet for a period of time, and then obviously we came back that way, so we were assigned to the 6th Fleet for a period of time. But there were no operations associated with our presence there, really just transiting uh, to and from our port visits and to and from, uh, from the Suez Canal to the Strait of Gibraltar. Um, so a lot of uh, exercise in the beginning of our deployment in the 5th Fleet, um, but you remember in June was when Egypt, the situation in Egypt hit ahead and we were assigned in an alert status. We operated then in the Red Sea for about a month um, in a be prepared to status to support uh, American interests in Egypt and the Colonel will talk to uh, what his Marines did. Uh, specifically in uh, the Egyptian embassy and how he supported uh, Ambassador Patterson there. Um, we were released when things, when we thought there were no longer a threat to American interest at late June, we were released and we did something very similar, uh, a be prepared to support American interest in Yemen. There were some, uh, some tensions there. 9-11 uh, anniversary um, came around during our deployment as well and we were down in the Gulf of Aden, which I guess I can back up again, that was where we spent the majority of our time, was in the Gulf of Aden. We spent about, I would say, 10 to 20 percent in the Red Sea a month, maybe two months, but I would say the majority of time we spent in uh, the Gulf of Aden. Very little time in the big, the big deck, very little time was spent in the Arabian Gulf. The two other ships uh, spent some time in the Arabian Gulf, I would say about half and half, <laughs> half in, half out. Um, but then after 9-11, uh, we postured ourselves to be able to support contingencies if anything occurred. As you know, Benghazi was on the anniversary of 9-11, so we were a little more prepared this time for if, there, if some bad <coughs> actors were going to do something on uh, to uh, anniversary to, uh, to uh, be, be prepared to support that. So that's the time frame of when we deployed, what we did. Um, like I said, the Colonel will talk specifically what, how we supported American embassies, how we were the crisis action uh, asset of choice, and, uh, and if there's any questions, certainly that's where we're looking to uh, how this brief to work. The ARGMU serves as the 
the, the premier crisis response force afloat uh, in CENTCOM AO or uh, UCOM AFRICOM AO as it transits through the Mediterranean. But the slide behind me shows uh, the where the RMU operated during the, the course of, it's, it's largely six months uh, in the CENTCOM AO and then about six and a half, seven months in CENTCOM AO and the other month about in, in the Mediterranean. Um, from, from exercises uh, in Oman, Qatar, <coughs> Jordan, uh, we had, were scheduled to do an exercise in Bright Star in Egypt. Uh, that exercise did not go, obviously. Uh, we did an exercise in the Republic of Jordan, uh, excuse me, the uh, Republic of Georgia as we came through the Mediterranean, trained in France, trained in um, uh, Greece, and a significant amount of training ashore in Djibouti uh, while the uh, you know, elements of the RMU were uh, stationed down in the Gulf of Aden. The Gulf of Aden is a very strategic location, not only from its positioning where it allows the RMU to either move north to the Red Sea if need be to support both um, countries within the CENTCOM AO uh, as well as AFRICOM AO as well. And another important part of that is how the, the, MU opera, the RMU operates along that seam between combatant commanders uh, and able to, to support uh, not only one combatant commander but two, potentially even three uh, simultaneously if need be. Um, and uh, also for the training that is a, we're able to do, not only our own unilateral training, but also bilateral training with French forces that are ashore in Djibouti. Um, we had uh, a series of engagements with um, embassies in the region. Those engagements were with uh, a capability that uh, is referred to either the forward command element or the forward coordination element of the, of the MU. It consists of the MU executive officer, my second in command, um, task organized with, with, with several other Marines, um, depending on what the mission may be. Uh, but what I did with that was put them on a road show, uh, if you will, to go to as many embassies as we could get access to, uh, to um, educate on the capabilities and limitations uh, with the country team of the yard MU. Um, as you can see on this slide, uh, above the, the purple circle, we made it to Lebanon, Egypt, Oman, Qatar, or excuse me, uh, Kuwait, ba Bahrain, and, uh, and Kuwait. We found it to be very educational for the country teams, as the country teams associated the ARGMU with that non-combatant evacuation operation. That's when they thought they would see the ARGMU, only if they needed to evacuate. And most, you know, obviously, embassies don't want to do that, um, and they really don't like to talk about that one. Uh, so that's what they associated our capabilities with. Um, we were able to, uh, to show how the ARGMU, uh, our capability sets and what we're, we're uh, the mission sets that we come ranges the full range of military operations from full kinetic operations, conventional operations, to humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, MC reinforcement, non-combatant evacuation, and others. Very robust capabilities and missions that we can execute. That was uh, kind of an aha moment, if you will, for uh, several of those country teams. But where it paid dividends uh, is we got into Egypt, uh, the embassy in Cairo, prior to the events unfolding in, in Egypt. And as we backloaded from the exercise in Jordan, Eager Line, Egypt was starting to occur, and, and we had the indications and warnings that we would be put on alert status to support in some form of fashion. Um, the <coughs> ambassador at the time was Ambassador Patterson, uh, quickly reached back out to the ARGMU and requested um, that FCE come back in to the, uh, to the embassy. Um, she saw him a couple weeks before, now she wanted him back. Um, was comforted by the fact that she had this, this link to the ARGMU in her embassy that could answer not only her questions, but questions of the larger country team about capabilities and limitations, and as the situation developed there, poten how potentially the RMU could be used. Um, our mission for, uh, for Egypt was to provide either embassy reinforcement, if need be, uh, and then also plan for the larger non-combatant evacuation uh, operation. Um, and also, not just in the embassy in Cairo, uh, but several other uh, locations within, uh, in and around Cairo, um, uh, that are, uh, were uh, of importance to, to the U.S. government. And we also were uh, in, uh, prepared to provide support uh, to uh, our, our British allies, our French allies, I believe the other was our, the Italians. 
um, uh, they were looking to us for uh, not the embassy reinforcement, but for the evacuation if need be. Um, so that SCE was proved very invaluable to us because of that relationship that we established with the uh, with the ambassador Patterson. Um, and as uh, as Jim mentioned, um, we also were uh, put on that same alert. Uh, uh, for our embassy in Sana'a, uh, Yemen. Again, uh, the uh, embassy reinforcement and an evacuation if need be. And then as the 9-11 anniversary came um, and the combatant commander looked at how, where could he have presence throughout the theater, our focus became not only Egypt and Yemen, but also added to the list Sudan, um, Oman, and uh, um, Bahrain as well. Uh, so very robust capability that the RMU team brings, uh, and we're able to maintain that presence throughout the, the, uh, the theater. It not only gives the combatant commander uh, a variety of options for employment, but also back here to our strategic decision makers, uh, not only time and space to have strategic level discussion of what the U.S. government's response will be, but also those options for military employment that are, that are offered by the uh, expeditionary nature of the RMU. So that, that's a snapshot of where where we spent our uh, our deployment in, in, in the events that unfolded while we were there. Any questions on any of that in particular? Hi, sir. George Marcus, consultant with U.S. COCOM. Do you have any kind of interface with the theater since the commanders had screened this force, either out of sight or Yes. If you can go to the uh, the soft integration slide, it'll just talk to the larger uh, how we integrate with soft, sir. Um, the integration with soft starts early on during our pre-deployment training, uh, and that the first portion of that is take seem the leadership of both the ARGMU down to Tampa to to get the SOCOM 101, um, and then we do, uh, expanded that relationship um, with uh, uh, with the folks up in Damneck. Uh, and conducted some integrated training with them during our, uh, during our pre-deployment uh, training and our eventual certification exercise. And then once we moved, as we transited through the Mediterranean, there was no interaction uh, with any uh, te uh, theaters um, soft uh, in, the, in the UCOM, AFRICOM, AO. When we got into CENTCOM, uh, we uh, Im immediately, our first event was to conduct a uh, tr integrated training uh, with national assets um, and then uh, we an element within the MU with a for a uh, my force reconnaissance platoon um, did conduct integrated training with the Cree the crisis response element that uh, seal platoon um, in uh, in the CENTCOM AO on uh, two different occasions and then we also uh, while we were uh, in the vicinity of, of Djibouti we did some training with with them as well does that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. Auto Chrysler reported with Sea Power and uh, Semper Fi uh, magazines. I noticed on your on your chart you had uh, M MV22 long range operations, one in Afghanistan, and one uh, somewhere in the Europe. I think. That, that is correct, yes, sir. Okay. All right. What, what were those? Were those uh, training <coughs> missions? Were you reinforcing? ill elements, what were you doing uh, particularly in Afghanistan? Good, good, good question, sir. Um, the, the first, um, if you see that blue star on the, towards the, uh, the left-hand side of the screen, when, when the MU, the ARGMU deployed, uh, we, uh, because of our co a, a compressed training schedule, uh, we did not uh, deploy completely certified in all our mission essential tasks. And one of those tasks that we were not certified in was um, uh, expeditionary, uh, the, our, my aviation combat element uh, conducting an expeditionary operation, operating out of an expeditionary environment. One of the, how we met that, um, that, uh, that certification was we conducted a 1400 nautical mile movement of uh, B-22s, it was three B-22s off of the, the USS Kearsarge uh, prior to entering into the Mediterranean married those aircraft up with a uh, KC-130J uh, tanker and flew um, nonstop to Stuttgart, Germany, where we provided a capability demonstration <coughs> for uh, the commanders and staff of both UCOM and AFRICOM <coughs> on the B-22, and then recovered that package back aboard the uh, USS Kearsarge, which is the, the, the big deck amphib, 
uh, in the Mediterranean. So that was the first uh, of those that uh, you referred to, sir. The second, the flight into Afghanistan. Um, over the last several years, uh, the, uh, the Marine Corps has been uh, replacing V-22s in Afghanistan with uh, V-22s that are deploying with the aviation combat element of the Marine Expeditionary Unit. Those aircraft that are in Afghanistan are aircraft that are due for depot level maintenance, which means they have to get back to the United States um, and, and go through that, uh, that high-end maintenance. So it's just a swap of aircraft. Um, those aircraft that, uh, so I, I flew five aircraft uh, from the, the, uh, from the uh, USS Kearsarge into Afghanistan, again with uh, KC-130J tanker support. Um, flew them nonstop into Afghanistan, conducted the uh, exchange of aircraft, and flew the, the other five aircraft back out to the Kearsarge. Those aircraft that were received from Afghanistan to, that, that came back to me uh, were, were mission-capable aircraft that, were, that could support the rest of my deployment. Uh, and, and they did not require the depot level maintenance until they got back to the United States. Uh, so th those were those two long range uh, flights of B-22 and, and, and that's uh, what you uh, uh, made reference to, sir. You just leave the aircraft to the crew and return with the, the, with the old bird? J just, just an exchange of the aircraft, not the crew, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Dan Lamotham with Foreign Policy Magazine. I was hoping you could walk us through the, uh, the run-up to the uh, tensions in Syria. Uh, I know the San Antonio transition looked like it was moving closer to the country. Um, just in terms of what you were planning for, what you thought you might uh, be tasked with, and then uh, I guess as it kind of tapered off again, what that let you, how, how you were allowed to kind of to back off again. And, um, as Jim already mentioned, as we prior to our deployment, obviously, uh, you know, the conditions on the ground in Syria were, you know, continued to deteriorate. And during our pre-deployment training, uh, we looked very closely at the, you know, the refugee, the humanitarian crisis that was occurring uh, in Jordan, uh, based off of uh, the, the conditions in Syria. So we put a lot of time and effort towards uh, how we would do a humanitarian assistance type um, operation. Uh, and when, for Exercise Eager Lion, which occurred in Jordan, uh, the entire <coughs> Marine Air Ground Task Force went ashore to support that exercise. Uh, and I, I thought that exercise would turn into something else, um, but it did not. Uh, the exercise stayed focused on, on the exercise objectives uh, and, and, and continuing to build and expand our, uh, our uh, partnership with, uh, with the Jordanian Armed Forces. It was a very successful exercise. Um, and, and, and there was no, you know, that's all that exercise was. Um, and as we watched for, uh, for, as the discussion of the strikes was occurring, uh, we did some of our own prudent planning um, as to if strikes would occur. Um, you know, air, that means aircraft are potentially flying, um, then there would have to be a capability uh, to conduct a recovery of either the aircraft or pilots if shot down, and that's a capability that the RMU has. It's called a tactical recovery of aircraft and personnel. Uh, so we looked at, uh, with that capability, uh, to how we would do that mission. Um, uh, we looked at that, um, and then as well as uh, other regional reactions to those strikes. Uh, if the strikes would occur, would that require embassy reinforcement in other countries um, throughout the region? So not just focused on specifically Syria, but also other countries in the regional reaction. Um, it should you know, the U.S. government, the international community take action uh, in Syria? Um, but uh, we were never tasked specifically to support, um, support, that, uh, support that. If you would have had to run the trap mission, would have been off the San Antonio and which aircraft? Uh, it would have been, you know, it could have come off the San Antonio, it could have come off the, uh, the, uh, the, the Kearsarge. Likely um, it would have come off the, uh, the Kearsarge with the V-22 uh, capability, but uh, I had my um, heavy lift um, helicopter, the CH-53 detachment, embarked on the, uh, the, the San Antonio, and that's an aircraft that could certainly use, be used for that mission. So it, uh, it, it depends on, you know, a lot of a lot of um, 
factors go into that decision, uh, but the, the takeaway is is that there's the, the, the capacity to do that is, uh, is, is extensive, both uh, on, from the aircraft that are provided in that, that aviation combat element and the platforms that the, uh, the amphibious ready group has uh, to allow us to do multiple platforms to support that, that type of mission. Uh, yes, good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm Paul Shankman with U.S. News and World Report. Thanks again for, uh, for doing this. Um, I'd be interested to sort of get your take on what you saw during Operation Eager Lion. What were some of the things that the Jordanians were concerned about, both spillover from Syria, but also in the, uh, the camps along the border there, the um, camps uh, for the refugees? What, what sort of issues were they talking about, and what did you see? I, I was ashore for the, uh, for the duration of the exercise, and, and for that exercise, our total focus was the exercise. It was meeting the, uh, the host nation uh, training requirements for exercise eager line. Um, it was the integration of, of, the, uh, of the, the Marines and sailors of the Marine Expeditionary Unit with the, uh, with the uh, Jordanian Armed Forces uh, from infantry, op uh, infantry mechanized assets, mechanics. Uh, we did some, uh, some of our FETs, our female engagement teams, uh, had a op very unique opportunity to work with um, a female uh, military policemen of the Jordanian uh, Armed Forces, uh, which was a, a very unique opportunity. Uh, we had engagements with um, uh, imams uh, within the Jordanian Armed Forces. Uh, so it was everything from tactics, techniques, and procedures, um, sharing those, uh, those techniques, tactics, techniques, and procedures, and doing the integrated training. That was the focus of the exercise, and there was, uh, at, at our level, at the tactical level, there was no discussion of anything else, uh, and, and every day it was, you know, the, the shoot, move, and communicate training, uh, expanding the capacity of our, of our partner nation, the Jordanians, um, learning about their culture, us, uh, 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 them learning about all, our culture, exchanging those ideas of, of tactics, techniques, and, and procedures, because you, you think, more often you think that they learn more than we do, but we learn a tremendous amount for uh, their capabilities and how they look at a tactical problem and how we uh, look at a tactical problem. So the, the focus of that exercise was that, that engagement between the, the two military units uh, and meeting the exercise objectives of the host nation. Otto Kreischer again. Uh, just a few days short of an eight-month eight uh, timeout. That, uh, the CNO says that's going to be the new norm. Okay, you've got a problem, you're, you're thinking you're going out for six, now you're going out for eight. What, 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 two, two questions. One, material readiness, keeping your, Captain, keeping your ships, you know, running, and, and uh, the Colonel, you've got the same thing with uh, your, your aircraft, m mainly. They're probably getting more use than your ground equipment. And then morale. I mean, you, you, some of us old enough to have done eight-month deployments in, in back in old days. Uh, it gets a little tiring. Uh, so you've got the morale problem, you've got the uh, material problems. You know, uh, how are you dealing with that? Well, I'll, I'll address the uh, material issue first. Um, very, very good support from our type commanders and uh, back in CONUS, making sure we go out the door in the best possible material condition that you can be. And, and that takes a, a tremendous effort from the maintenance community and the operational community being integrated and knowing what the issues are and, and really uh, spending a lot of effort, not just financially, but uh, manpower, getting us out the door ready to go. Uh, once we're out there, you know, the, we need to be self-sufficient and we need to fix our own gear, but there's also a lot of distance support that we have. We also worked very closely with the, the theater before we even left to establish a mid-deployment voyage repair period. Every ship was able to take advantage of a, an extended period for at least a week, seven to nine days. Every ship got in, in the ARG got a period um, to work and just do maintenance. So they pulled into either Bahrain or Jebel Ali in the United Arab Emirates. Um, and they work, and there is a forward maintenance uh, facility and people over there who bring technical reps to fix stuff that's beyond the capability that's more of, not necessarily a depot level. You're not going to be able to do that at sea, but you're going to be able to do some intermediate maintenance that, uh, that is beyond ship's force capability. Um, 
but so there are some tech reps that come out to you, but we do have some dedicated time, uh, and we beat the drum pretty loudly that you need to give, you know, you need to be out there and you need to be at sea because that's where it matters. But at the same time, if you're going to sustain that, and especially for long periods like eight months, you got to give a couple days in port here and there, and, and we're able to work very closely. And people realize that, and leaders realize that. And when I asked for that, I, I generally got it unless we were at an alert status. We, we did have some time in port to work on those things. And, and then as far as the morale issue goes, we did know we were going for eight months. So it wasn't like we went for six and it got extended. And I've always been a believer that if you tell a sailor or, or a Marine what you're doing, why you're doing it, and they understand what the mission is, then morale will take care of itself. And we were doing important stuff. They knew we were doing important stuff. They, they signed up to do this in a time of war, post 9-11, and, uh, and, and I didn't see any issues with morale. The Colonel can kind of, I'm sure, agree with me. Absolutely, and you look, especially in the, it was a, approximately 100 days of, of being on alert, I mean, dedicated to either, as we talk, uh, Egypt, Yemen, or the, that 9-11 anniversary window. And, and during those, those days of, of that focused alert status, um, you know, we, we were placed on some very high, high alert status from a one hour alert to a three hour alert <coughs> and down to a six hour alert. Uh, and over a course of an extended period of time that, uh, as you would expect, take, takes, takes a drain out of, uh, out of the individual Marine and sailor. But you go and talk to those young Marines and sailors uh, every day, they're, they're, you know, they're bringing up their gear and they're staging it to be prepared to load up on a helicopter. Uh, and, and fly into an embassy to reinforcement, and the trigger doesn't get pulled for. The decision is, you know, not made to, you know, we're not going, we're not going, we're not going. But they're, hey, sir, we're ready to go. We're ready to go. Get us in there. We're ready to go. And day in and day out, that's their attitude. That That's their focus. And it is truly absolutely amazing. Uh, and, and, and those young Marines and sailors and those small unit leaders, they, they maintain that. Uh, that focus, they maintain that dedication, uh, and and they are ready to go. You you, you throw in some liberty here and there, uh, and they understand that hey, we might not get that liberty port. Uh, we understand that you know operational needs will you know trump everything, uh, and but you, they're 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 focused every day, um, and it's it's truly uh, truly amazing to watch. Uh, equipment readiness on for the for the marine side, um, you know the. Those, uh, those opportunities that the ships have to get in the port uh, to do some extended maintenance are also important to, to the MU as well uh, because now I have the opportunity to get vehicles off the ships uh, so we can spread them out and do some uh, a little higher end uh, maintenance on those vehicles uh, that, that you can't do when they're very close together inside the, the, the ships. The aircraft maintenance, uh, it's a little easier to get to because they're out on the flight deck or you bring them down to the hangar bay. Um, and, and you can do uh, you can do that high-end maintenance um, at that at, at the level that we're authorized to do it uh, without having to go into a port. Uh, but aviation ma maintenance, uh, aviation readiness uh, for the for the mag type was exceptionally well. It was for that I have 29 aircraft that make up that uh, that aviation combat element. Um, it was over a 75 percent mission capable readiness rate uh, over the course of our deployment, which was. Uh, which was very high. And, uh, ground combat gear was very high as well, and, and with the, the logistics, the support system that's set up in theater and, and working through that. And there are some challenges at times, but you work through that, and uh, your, your proactiveness in, in what's uh, already set up in theater is, is the key to your success. Thank you. Uh, Olga Belagalova from Inside the Navy. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, in April, the um, Marine Corps stood up a um, special um, crisis response team out um, for AFRICOM, and the Marine Corps is looking to stand up another um, within the year in CENTCOM. Can you talk about how you foresee interactions, support, collaboration for some of the embassy engagements and future operations with these special crisis response teams? Yes, um, that's it's the special purpose MAGTAF uh, crisis response. Uh, that's the, uh, the the name given uh, to that capability. Um, it's it's not a full. Uh, uh, it, it does not have the same capability as as a Marine Expeditionary Unit. 
Uh, it's much smaller, uh, its capacity is less, and it doesn't have the same, same capability. But wh what it provides now, and that, and that <coughs> capability is currently a land-based capability. Uh, but again, it's another option <coughs> capability for the combatant commander. Um, and I foresee possible uh, interaction in, in how the, the, the ARG MU and the Special Purpose MAGTAP crisis <coughs> response may uh, come together in that crisis response model. Um, uh, potentially, you know, initially, let's say, embassy, uh, let's just use Libya. Uh, there's a requirement for uh, reinforcement uh, of that embassy in Libya, and Special Purpose MAGTAP crisis response goes and supports. Um, that becomes extended over time, the ARGMU is coming back into the Mediterranean or uh, the requirement, the, the situation on the ground appears that it's expanding so the ARGMU is chopped from CENTCOM to AFRICOM and then the additional enablers and capability that the ARGMU has can then be used to reinforce and expand and extend the, the, the existing, the, the capabilities of, of that special purpose MAGTAP crisis response. So, uh, for the co combatant commanders, it provides additional options and it provides uh, um, you, uh, an opportunity to, uh, uh, to uh, extend, uh, extend capabilities when uh, it's married up uh, in, in with a, uh, uh, the, the ARGMU uh, that may come into theater. So I think, uh, I think we're going to see some very positive developments with that. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Well, I would also be curious um, if Special purpose MAGTAP crisis response. Yes, special purpose MAGTAP crisis response, <laughs> uh, in, crisis response in, in, um, in, in this, uh, the, our past deployment, um, uh, we, we did conduct a segregated operations, which meant uh, while uh, two, we had to chop one of our ships, uh, Jim had to chop one of his ships uh, with, the, with uh, Embark Marines uh, from CENTCOM to AFRICOM. Uh, so the, the Marines, all my Marines that were on, on the ship, the USS San Antonio and all my equipment, I had to offload in row to Spain. So while they were ashore in row to Spain and, and with crisis response, that special purpose MAGTAP in Marone, Spain, which is very close by, um, I some of my, uh, sent some of my Marines uh, up to Marone uh, to conduct some training, uh, training in uh, uh, non-combatant evacuation. Um, <coughs> mission essential task uh, with some of our, uh, our, our unique, uh, some of our equipment that we use to support that, uh, it's called the, the NEO tracking system specifically. Uh, we gave, uh, gave the crisis response marines some uh, training on that, I sent some uh, maintainers, uh, some maintenance marines up to uh, assist with some maintenance. So, and, and this is the first deployment where the you know, Special Purpose MAGTAP crisis response was forward deployed in the ARGMU, or a portion of the MU anyway. So. That was the, the first opportunity, uh, but again, there was that, uh, that, uh, that opportunity to integrate and support, uh, and, it, and it proved beneficial for both. Sir, hi, George Knucklesen again. Uh, several weeks ago, General McKenzie uh, was speaking, and I asked the question about the future of MARSOC. He said one of the discussions that's been going on between General Amos and Admiral McRaven, the SOCOM commander, is taking MARSOC elements and going ahead and deploying them with a the MU. Uh, the second question is, you talked about the potential of operations in Syria. I was at a briefing this morning with the former Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Mosley. He indicated what a high threat environment operating in Syria was. In terms of your capabilities and your V-22s, uh, your MV-22s, uh, I understand you do not have DIRCOM on them yet, or you don't have uh, CERFIC on them, or, uh, or Link 16. Any uh, insights onto what the future of that is. Uh, as for the, Ben Steinberg, can you uh, turn the uh, soft integration slide? Um, there we go. Um, this, the, to the first question, uh, uh, kind of expand beyond just just Marshak. Uh, at, when I was a, uh, a, a battalion landing team commander, uh, when we first uh, stood up Marshak, uh, a a a, a Marshak or MSOC, Marine Special Operations Company, did uh, the deploy initially uh, with, at the time, the MUSOC, but only to, to get it from, really from uh, the East Coast into uh, the CENTCOM AO, and then we onward, they onward movement forward to uh, Afghanistan. Um, but the, the, 
the um, integration of, uh, of the ARG MU uh, while in theater is, uh, and those opportunities was solved, there, there, there's a lot of opportunity there. And it starts in our pre-deployment training um, where, where, we, uh, where we do some work with uh, the National Mission Force um, and then do some integrated training in theater. There's the crisis response <coughs> element, uh, the, the Navy SEAL platoon and 5th Fleet that we did training with. Um, and in discussion with General Amos, uh, we gave this, uh, this brief to General Amos and the Secretary of the Navy several, several days ago, uh, and, and we talked about the, the soft integration and looking beyond just the, 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 the natural start point for the MU is with MARSOC, because we all wear the same uniform, speak the same language. Um, and then <coughs> to expand from there with the larger soft community, uh, and as I saw, uh, there's an opportunity to do for the to support of the the FID mission, the Foreign Internal Defense Mission, uh, that the soft community uh, uh, does. We, with the RMU deploys with a lot of enablers uh, that those small soft teams that are conducting that you know, that, that very tactical level training uh, with host nation uh, soft like forces uh, that could augment that mission, um, whether it's in East Africa or whether it's in CENTCOM. Uh, th there's a, I see an opportunity there to uh, provide, to, to augment uh, and enhance uh, the, those training missions. Um, and, and I think that will be uh, the way forward uh, uh, with continuation of expanding uh, the MU integration, our MU integration with, with, uh, with, uh, with SOF. Um, uh, flying within in Syria would have been a very complex, uh, very, uh, complex nut to crack, if you will, uh, because of the very, uh, uh, very robust and extensive um, um, anti-air defense system uh, that the Syrians have. So obviously that was, that's a, uh, a, a joint uh, problem to solve and how we <coughs> would have eliminated those, those threats if the ARGME was going to be deployed, because I don't have that capability organic in my aviation combat element, so that would require the, the larger joint force to obviously set the conditions to allow the argument to be able to fly uh, in, in that environment. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Megan Eckstein with Defense Daily. Uh, so I know past ARGMU teams uh, during pre-deployment training and uh, during the exercises and training during the deployments um, have had a little bit of a chance to sort of play with how they want to allocate the platforms and people between the three ships. Um, and you know, potentially find new uses for equipment that you bring along with you or whatnot. Um, so I wondered during your deployment, especially with budgets being what they are, if you were able to find ways to get more uh, capability out of what you brought with you or if you found new uses for any of your gear or anything to, I guess, be more effective while you were at sea. That's for you. And, uh, <laughs> Steve Burke, can you go to the, uh, there's a, th that, that's what it looked like um, for, the, the three ships and how, um, for the MAGCAF, how I embarked uh, my capabilities on, on those three ships. Um, what influenced, the, in, in what's, what's the, I guess what I would draw your attention to is down at the bottom, kind of right of each column, where it says capabilities. Um, with all that equipment that's above that, that's what I was, I was able to do with each of those ships. If they, if those ships were operating independently uh, or the uh, perf uh, aggregated, but you can see from embassy reinforcement, QRS, QRS stands for Quick Reaction Force. It's a reinforcement type capability uh, that can be task organized to a platoon size, which is about 30 some Marines to up to a company over 100 Marines or something in between. Uh, that tactical recovery of aircraft and personnel. Um, you can see with two of the ships, I had both an air capability for that and a surface capability for that. Um, there's the uh, counter IED capability. Um, there's the um, uh, landing force shore party, the, the, the Marines that go ashore to run the beach if we're doing an offload, um, to conducting NEOs and the ECC, the evacuation control centers. Um, the, the most robust capabilities were found on the, the, the big deck, the, the Kearsarge, and then the San Antonio, and lesser capability on the, uh, on the LSD, the, uh, the, the Carter Hall. What you, uh, another, what I would draw your attention to for the San Antonio is I put an aviation, a, 
an aviation debt over on the USS San Antonio to allow for assault support, the ability to pick up Marines and fly them in. Um, and I put my four CH-53s, it's a heavy lift helicopter uh, that has a refueling probe. I, I put that detachment uh, over on that deck uh, and that allowed me to move upwards to a Marine rifle company of about 150 Marines, not quite the whole thing in one lift, but close to it. Um, it also allowed me the capability to uh, move other weapon systems, our, the Marine Corps' new one, uh, the 120 millimeter mortar, um, which was my first time deploying with that, uh, that capability. That can be internally transported, both the CH-53 and the MV-22, a very uh, expeditionary fire system, put it in an airplane and fly it ashore, can go ashore with a raid force if need be. Uh, can go ashore in support of a, uh, an airfield seizure if need be. So very uh, provide some flexibility and in indirect fire assets uh, for uh, for the uh, for the MU. So that's uh, that's how I uh, what was my what we call assignment to shipping. Uh, and I looked at it from if we would go disaggregate in, in a ship where two ships would be pulled away and operate in a different theater. Um, I was had some capability on those ship to be able to respond to uh, uh, missions tasked by the combatant commander, and then also have the ability to cross deck, move people and equipment uh, while while deployed if 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 we don't have what's needed on that uh, on that ship. But uh, my equipment set, what was new to my equipment set, new equipment in the inventory. Um, was that uh, was that mortar system, that 120 millimeter mortar system? I was the last uh, Mu Aviation Combat Element deployed with is now our Legacy UH-1 November uh, Huey uh, helicopter, uh, utilitary uh, utility, utility air aircraft. It's now uh, uh, referred to as it, it's the Yankee model. It's a four-bladed aircraft, has an improved uh, uh, engine, has different avionics but allows to each aircraft to move about nine combat-loaded Marines, which is a significant upgrade from the, the Legacy Huey, which you got about four combat-loaded Marines in it, and you know, if, if it wasn't too hot and too, uh, too humid out, you, you might get that package up. It was just, we, we, the MAGTAF, the Marine Air Ground Task Force, has become very, very heavy. Uh, for the fight that we had in Iraq and Afghanistan, not only just our up-armored weapon systems, uh, but also the individual Marine with our body armor. It's a heck of a lot heavier now uh, than when I was a lieutenant you know, 25 years ago. And our flak jacket weighed about seven pounds and we used to complain and now it's over 40 pounds of weight that you're putting on you. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, Rick Burgess, Sea Power Magazine. Uh, Cam Cody, uh, your two MH-60S helicopters uh, did they do anything other than just logistics and uh, plane guard type things? And uh, I remember one of your predecessors saying that he would love to have three of those helicopters. Do you see any kind of uh, push to uh, increase that by one? Uh, answer to your first question, they did not do anything besides uh, the SAR mission as well as some logistics uh, support. Um, and I would tell you that we wrote a point paper and my background, I worked with uh, SH-60 Bravos my whole life, so which is now the Romeo, and I would love to have a Romeo in addition to the Sierras. I think there would be a good mix of up to upwards of four. You know, uh, two Romeos, two Sierras would be the best mix, and if you couldn't, three with one of them being a Romeo would help a lot because, as you know, that Sierra does not have a data link or radar, and the Romeo does, and uh, I think it would be very, very helpful for our recognized maritime picture, and uh, what they when we send them up there, they could uh, enhance that picture. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Bill Powers with the Potomac Institute. I see you've got Scan Eagle up there as kind of a shared asset. Can you talk a little bit about how you shared it, and it, did you use it at all for operations? How do you use it in the operations center? Well, right now it's a navy navy asset. Well, it's, and we've had it on the San Antonio on the LPD. It was a blue asset for the most part. Uh, certainly would have been used if, if, if we needed it operationally, uh, it would have been, uh, again, we get back to that supporting, supported commander. Uh, we didn't use it operationally. What we used it for, uh, we had uh, allocated hours and we flew it quite a bit, but uh, really just used it to enhance our recognized maritime picture. Flew it almost every morning, sent it up uh, to validate, validate AIS tracks 
as well as make just check out uh, what was out there, look at our common operational picture, and uh, validate the radar picture. Contractor support. Yes, sir. That capability will uh, soon be uh, organic to the, the MU ACE 2014-2015 uh, with the, the STU as the, the small tactical un unmanned aerial system. Uh, so it will become a, a, a MU asset part of that aviation combat element, but to su support the yard MU. Hi, Paul Shankman again. I'd like to ask you about um, sequestration. As I understand it, that wouldn't have affected your training or your deployment, given when it happened and the fact that you were deploying. Now that you're back to the States, presumably it will. I wonder if you're already seeing any cuts or planning for any kind of shortages or what you're sort of worried about in the coming months with that. Uh, well, I would tell you that, you know, we saw the government shutdown and sequestration kind of came about as we were in the <coughs> final stages of our workouts. And rightfully so, the services have done a very, very good job of insulating deployed units and deployers from that. So we felt pretty insulated the whole time. We didn't feel zero to no effect. The government shutdown, we saw some effect when we have some reach <coughs> back and some technical support that we look for and we rely on that wasn't there a little bit, but I would say that was a, a very, very minor inconvenience, not really an impact. Um, but the way, at least in the Navy side, we come back, we're, we're on the bottom now in terms of uh, priorities. You know, if there's one through five, let's say, you know, we're, we're five now. We were one, we're five now. We won't necessarily uh, fill our storerooms. Uh, we won't necessarily be, we won't, we, that's where readiness will suffer, is, is the people who are not deployed, not really the next ones up either. All of our focus will go there. So, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Lieutenant oh. Steenberg, can you go to the uh, slide that uh, shows the, the pre-deployment training picture? Just a, one more, there we go. That big green block on the on the right hand side there, those are all the all the events and requirements for training uh, that uh, that we that the ARGMU uh, must complete during its six month pre deployment training program, uh, and, and that's uh, there's no indication that, that any of that is going away. So, um, will we have the, the same amount of uh, of, uh, of you know? Of, bullets to shoot, if you will, um, I, I don't know, uh, but that those requirements, because those the, those events right there lead to the certification of the ARGMU of that mission essential task list that we must be able to execute, uh, so that that period of training and the, and, and the resources to support to, to do that um, are, <coughs> will, that, that they will be there to be able to support those those events, because that, that's what achieves the certification of the ARGMU. As long as the ARGMU deploys with the same capabilities, uh, mission sets uh, that it's supposed to, that we do with now. Thank you. Uh, Dan with Foreign Policy again. Uh, early this year, uh, uh, Colonel, your, your, your uh, colleague from the, the last MU through the Potomac Institute uh, spoke to uh, some of the interdiction missions that he did, uh, force recon platoon sort of operations. Uh, he mentioned working off a destroyer at one point and uh, VBSS type of, type of operations. Uh, can, can you maybe fill us in on the sort of things you did along those lines? We did zero. We had, that is the, the VBSS, the Visit Board Search and Seizure mission, uh, is, a, uh, is, a, is a capability that the ARGMU has, uh, and it's a true uh, ARGMU integrated um, capability. Um, we trained to it, we were certified to it, uh, to be able to do, as we say, top down, bottom up from an assault force that comes from both uh, helicopters, from surface craft, uh, and be able to do it in an imposed environment. We trained to it, um, we, were not, uh, we were not tasked to do that, uh, and uh, for, uh, the, uh, for um, the, the boarding teams for, for the ARG, I'm going to let Jim can speak to that, we're not tasked to do any boardings as well. So we had a completely different experience than Colonel Campbell in the 15th MU. Uh, and, and that's what you see. Each ARGMU deploys. There's some similarities in the deployments, but there's also a lot of uh, 
each RMU has a different experience just based off the environment and what the requirements are, but we didn't execute. And just of note, as you probably all have seen in the news, there were no piracy events that is really gone. That problem, I would say, it seemed at least to be solved while we were there uh, off of Somalia, migrated a little bit to the other coast of Africa. But uh, no, no piracy events that we had to support, and the Navy ships really, you know, I made a deployment uh, a couple times where we did boardings every day. It's just not something with... Uh, you know, the sanctions against Iraq not really being enforced and that mission not being uh, as heavily um, done anymore. So we didn't do any boardings. Dave Brees from Potomac Institute. Could you speak your interface with the Carrier Battle Group? We operated, now the Carrier Battle Group, while we were there, there were a couple of them. I think the Ike was there, the Truman was there, and the Nimitz. Nimitz came over in the Red Sea, actually. So those were the Carrier Battle Groups. Um, Ike and Truman operated in the North Arabian Sea off the coast of Afghanistan. We, we didn't. We never operated up there for any extended period of time. We operated a little bit when we were doing that MV-22 swap that we mentioned earlier. Well, we uh, had to fly those 22s there. So we, we stayed there for a couple days. Uh, we had a lot of airspace communication with them about airspace deconfliction where we were going to operate, where they were going to operate. We shared air plans. I spoke to, um, they have a new construct where they have a British Commodore aboard, and uh, I spoke to the Commodore about mutual support, uh, lessons learned, um, things we've seen. We had just came through the Strait of Hormuz, and he, he had some questions about that. But that was the extent of our operations. And, really, and then when the Nimitz came through, they were up in the Red Sea, we were down in the Gulf of Aden, uh, very little interaction besides, as mentioned previously, shared our air plans, our air officers talked to each other to make sure that we knew what each other were doing and uh, that we didn't get in each other's way. But that was really about the extent of it. I don't know if you had anything more to add to that. No. Auto Chrysler again. Disaggregated ops getting to be the norm for the ARGs. Uh, and they're Apparently, the Navy and the Marine Corps are working on a, on a doctrine to, to guide that thing. Were you guys, and as part of your training or your the way you organized your, your command structure or to prepare for that, or how do you adjust when you've got to uh, split up your, your ARG and the, the colonel has to offload or, or redistribute his people? Uh, do you have policies for it now, or are you just ad hocing as you go? Well, I guess I'll speak to it first and just make sure we understand the terms. If you're in the same COCOM and you have tactical control of the units, that's not disaggregated. We don't consider that disaggregated. That's split ARGOPS, and we do that all the time. And I feel very, very comfortable with that. We still, I could be in the Gulf of Aden on the flagship, the Carter Hall and the San Antonio could be in off the coast of Kuwait, they're still under my tactical control. I'm still talking to them every day. I can still influence events. They're still communicating to me. We, we, we operate like that all the time. And my background coming from cruiser and destroyer Navy carriers, the parts of their strike group operate like that all the time. Disaggregated, and we experienced it here, was when I lost tactical control of the San Antonio. They went and operated under a different COCOM and they had, TACON was, of San Antonio was someone else. They were under the tactical control of a, a task force in the Mediterranean. So I, day to day, I had zero influence on San Antonio. So challenging, but I mean, it's the way we do business. We did not, we made a conscious decision because we had a compressed training cycle, not to train in a disaggregated fashion. Um, I think the challenges are all much more uh, prevalent with the MU and the ACE in particular, and I'll let uh, the Colonel talk to that. Um, but, and, and most of it is logistics and aircraft. Um, but we, I, I think you just, if you have a very good understanding, you need a very good understanding of command and control. Because that's, it's gonna be flexed, and it's gonna be exercised, and if you don't understand it, that's when you might get in trouble. So, I'll turn it over. This would refer to the, the discussion on the assignment to shipping. Part of that was, as, again, having a fairly reasonable, or very very confident that we were going to go disaggregated at one point in time during our deployment. So to 
embark uh, capabilities across all three ships to be able to support that. Um, knowing that, again, once in theater, because it all depends on what's the mission going to be for the ship uh, or ships uh, that are disaggregated, that go to support another COCOM. What is that mission going to be? What we experienced, uh, the, the San Antonio became an afloat staging base for, uh, for SAW. So for me, it was, I had to offload. But where do you offload at? Um, you know, in this case, it was in the Mediterranean, it was in uh, Rota, Spain. Well, the infrastructure to support the 500 plus Marines uh, that I had ashore uh, was there. There was an airfield to support the 53 dead, so the infrastructure ashore was there. Um, if we were, not, if they were not, did not have the opportunity to offload in Rota, where would they offload and, and would the infrastructure be there? I still have equipment that needs to be maintained, um, both ground equipment and, and in this case, a, a, an aviation debt. So we have to be able to get those parts uh, that are now made, they're, they're, they're coming to the, the, the CENTCOM AO, they're coming out to the Kearsars. Now we've got to uh, get those parts to, to the Mediterranean so it can support uh, the, those capabilities uh, that, are, that, are, uh, that are in the Mediterranean. So. You have to work through those challenges. Um, the, the C2, for this case, uh, my Marines that were ashore, um, the command structure went from uh, my battalion, my subordinate commander, which was a battalion commander, lieutenant colonel, to re he was under the tactical control of Marine Forces Africa. Um, but I still had day to day contact with him, whether it was on the phone, whether it was uh, Nippernet, Cipernet. And I could still influence, and I could still have good as situational awareness of what he was doing, what uh, what was occurring. He had no other mission to shore. Mar four aft did not task him to be, you know, be prepared to serve as a embassy reinforcement, be prepared to provide some capability. Was not tasked with that. Uh, we had that discussion. We being um, in between uh, UCOM or within um, Mar four aft, myself. Uh, the, the, the fleet, uh, the, the FMO, the fleet uh, marine <coughs> officer to the sixth fleet um, to discuss what would the marine assets, the marines from the MU ashore, would they be tasked to do anything? We, the discussion was no, they will, they will stay ashore in Rota and focus on the washing down of their equipment because it was near the end of our deployment and all that equipment has to be washed and, and agriculturally inspected. Uh, but they did provide, as we talked about, they did provide some support to Special Purpose Mac Tap Crisis Response. Uh, they did some work with the CBs in Rota, so there was some some uh, some work that they did. But they weren't for for crisis response or contingency. They weren't tasked with anything. Now, could they have been used if needed? Yes. And then we always knew that that was you know that could happen, but it wasn't. So, what's the mission going to be? Is the right capability on the ship? Uh, do I need to cross deck provide uh, uh, augment? Uh, whether it's equipment or whether it's Marines and sailors. Um, and then you know, that will, can also influence what, what's that C2, gonna, C2 structure gonna be. So that, that's where, what Jim has already mentioned, that's the, a very, everybody needs to have a very clear understanding of that. Uh, and when at the end of the day you slap the table, everybody should walk away with the same understanding of what that C2 is. Because if there's, somebody walks away with a different opinion, then you're, you're gonna probably have some problems. General Flynn will have the uh, last question before we uh, ask you to join us at the bar for more informal questions. Okay, so I'm uh, going to enter into service pretty quick, two big decks without well decks. So any, I, you know, as we're going to develop those con ops, any insights from how you've operated and from your experience as to what changes that could bring to how you, how you organize, how you, how you do all this when you bring in two big decks with... Uh, without the well deck, both on your loadouts and how you conduct some of your missions, just to inform the con ops that have to be developed. Yes, sir, and, uh, it, and that was, it was a project we wanted, I wanted to take on during the deployment, but it was to take the, the assignment, the, my, my equipment set uh, that I showed on that one slide and try, embark that on the LHA America, LHA 6, and two small decks, an LPD class, 17 class, and an LSD to see what was going to fit and what wasn't going to fit. Obviously, without the well deck on the, uh, uh, the LHA-6, um, now that you don't have those surface, 
ship to shore connectors, those LCACs or LCUs. Uh, so the only way for the for the for the MU to move capability ashore from that platform, it's going to have to fly ashore. Um, so that's limited in, in what you can fly ashore in, in large scale weapon systems. Um, we do the EFS, that 120 millimeter mortar. Um, that's a capability that I would have on that on that platform, uh, and I would I would look to have more of those. Um, uh, you, the way uh, most uh, um, uh, the MUSE are task organized, there's a Helleborn raid force, there's a surface and two surface raid forces. Um, I, I see that one of those surface raid forces becoming another uh, Helleborn or vertical assault raid force. Um, so th th that becomes a, uh, a platform that you're going to have to fly, be able to fly capability ashore. And now your LCACs and LCUs, your, those ship to shore connectors, and your Amtraks, your AABs, your amphibious assault vehicles, uh, are going to have to be on the two small decks. Um, you're gonna, there's not going to be enough room for uh, all the up armored Humvees that we have, all the seven ton pickup truck or trucks that we have. So capability is going to be left ashore. Um, and then it's a decision of what capability that's going to be. Uh, and can you take some of that capability and then move it via black bottom or strat lift it in the theater so then you can, or pull from what we call the MAP, the MU Augmentation Platoon uh, or program rather, that has equipment sets uh, in um, Kuwait uh, that could, uh, MU can pull from to use to augment existing capability or fill a shortfall uh, that, that you may deploy with. So it, it, it creates some very unique challenges. Um, with the addition of some of our, our upgrades of our, our aviation capabilities, uh, the, what's the ace of the future going to look like? Maybe more of the UH-1 Yankees uh, uh, and, and, and less B-22s or less 53s. We'll have the, eventually the 53 kilo uh, in, enhanced range uh, capacity to lift. So uh, the, those are, are some very uh, interesting discussions that are occurring within my service, the, the Marine Corps right now. Um, is what that U may look like and how it embarks, especially when you have an amphib that doesn't have a well. So, does that answer your question, sir? I, I think you also, I mean, there's going to be some big decisions made on what you put on the LPD, and now if that disaggregates, that may exacerbate your problem or make it much a much bigger problem that you hadn't, uh, you might have some unintended consequences. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on, once again, on, on behalf of uh, Mike Swetnam and uh, General Gray, we want to thank you for coming today. Uh, Jim and Matt, I want to thank you for sharing your thoughts. One of the reasons why headquarters uh, likes to end, end the day here is uh, we like to make this a Q&A where the audience gets to uh, really grill you a little bit. Right. And uh, we like to have a beer afterwards where they really get to grill you. So, uh, so on behalf of that, Jim Pickleman's got the, uh, got the opener. Please, let's uh, adjourn to the bar. Sounds like a plan. Thank you.